Amen. I invite you to open up your Bible with me to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. We are going to conclude our series of messages today where we've been talking about the words of eternal life. You remember, whenever all of the people were going away from Jesus, all those would-be disciples are going away from Jesus, and Jesus turns to the twelve and he says, Do you want to go away as well? Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? For you have the words of eternal life. And today we're going to conclude that series and we're going to look at the last words and I've entitled the message, Whosoever Believes. Whosoever Believes. Now, that's King James language, so the whosoever part, but I really like that language because it's not just a who, but it means whosoever, anyone, anyone who ever lived, whoever believes. If you will believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, you will have eternal life. Um, I, I think about the context here in John chapter 5. If you have your Bible open, you can kind of scan through with me. Imagine living your whole life paralyzed, invalid, 38 years. Jesus comes up to the man by the pool of Bethesda and he says, do you want to be healed? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no one to put me in the pool. When the water is stirred up, there's this, uh, this local myth that when the water is stirred up, for whatever reason, that if anyone enters in the pool, they'll be healed. Maybe that happened one day. Something happened. But this man has been bound to that hope, that false hope, that demonic hope. For so long, that false religion. And Jesus says, do you want to be healed? Jesus said to him, get up, take up your bed and walk. Well, guess what happens? Verse 9 says, once the man was healed and he took up his bed and walked. Amen. Jesus has power over disease. And he has all authority. And so this man gets up and he walks. The problem is... That this happens on the Sabbath. And to all the, the good, God-fearing Jewish people, that was illegal. Can't do that. So they, they begin to question Jesus and ask him, you know, why are you doing this? Why are you doing these things? And verse 18, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him because not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. Now, that, that phrase right there is what precipitates everything else that Jesus says. They basically put Jesus on trial right here. We think the trial is later on and the formal trial really is later on. But the Jews solidified their opinion against him because Jesus claimed that he was equal with God. And that claim um, cannot result in neutrality. You're going to be on one side of that claim or the other. You, you can't stand in the middle. You can't ride that fence. You can't listen to someone say, I am equal to God, and therefore I deserve your worship. You can't listen to someone say that and then remain neutral. C.S. Lewis says if somebody makes a claim like that, they're either, either a liar, like they know that it's not true, but they're telling you it anyway, so they're a liar trying to deceive you, or... They, it's not true, and they don't know it, therefore they're a lunatic, or it's true, and Jesus is Lord. But a decision must be made. A decision has to be made. You can't be Switzerland when it comes to this claim that Jesus makes. Edwin Hubble Chaplin not the guy that was the astronomer. He was a pastor and preacher in the 1800s. He said, neutral men are the devil's allies. And so this claim 
it, it, this, this testimony of Jesus, it requires a verdict. And so the biblical truth today, Jesus' testimony about himself demands a verdict. Which side will you be on? What will be your verdict about it? Let's put Jesus on trial today. And let's hear his words, hear his claims. Why don't you stand with me? We're just going to read verses 19 and following together. We'll read down through verse 24. John 5, verse 19. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, that the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. And greater works than these will he show him, so that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. The Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son, that all may honor the Son, just as they honor the Father. Whoever does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. Now, if you like to underline or highlight anything in your Bible, underline that phrase. Whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. Let us pray together. Father, I thank you for your word today, and I pray that as we look into your word, that you will illuminate your word for us today. Lord, set our minds to the task of understanding your word today, and set our hearts and our feet and our hands to the task of obeying everything that you reveal. Lord, that you'll receive the glory and honor that's due your name. Through the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Jesus wants us to consider these claims. And John, the apostle, as he is recording these words of Jesus, he knows that these words are the most provocative words that are ever written in Scripture. That these words, they, they stand against everything that's raised up against the knowledge of God and who he is and who Jesus is. So first, as we come to this text, let us consider his claim. I want you to consider it. What that means is engage your mind in what Jesus said. So did you bring your brain to church? Did you leave it at home? I hope you brought your Bible and I hope you brought your brain. You should bring those two things with you every time you come to church. Amen. You should bring your heart as well. To worship the Lord Jesus. But let's consider his claim. The first thing Jesus says is truly, truly. The words there in Greek are amen, amen, which we get our English words amen from. When you pray, it's just not just a tag on the end that says that's the end of my prayer, which that's how we use it. We just put amen at the end of our prayer, meaning, all right, I'm finished, now we can eat. Right. But that's not what the word means. The word means truly or 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 this is the truth or or in other words, when we say it, we agree. So Jesus is using the word and he doesn't just use it once. He uses it twice to give emphasis. And he wants to emphasize that his audience needs to pay attention to these words because they are true. And it's that the truth of Jesus's words are set against the backdrop of the lie that has been perpetuating Uh, throughout Jewish society, that this man was believing by the pool of Bethesda. That if he would go down into the water at the right time, he would be healed and he'd have everything he needed. And not just that, it was against the the truth that Jesus was teaching, was against the satanic false religion, the religious legalism and superstition that gripped all of the hearts of the Jews that day. The same things that grip hearts of men and women today. Putting their hopes and Dreams and things that cannot save or satisfy us. The truth of the gospel is the only truth that's going to bring healing to us. He says, consider these claims. Truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord. So here's the first. Here is the first of his claim. The first truth that Jesus is equal to God, the father. Wow. 
That's pretty amazing. So Jesus is saying that he's equal to God the Father. The Father and the Son share activity together. So Jesus is saying, I don't do anything except for what the Father is doing. How many of you can say that? The only things I ever do are what God does. I mean, that would be an audacious claim for any of us to make. To say, only things I ever do is stuff that God does. No. You know that's not true. You can't do the things that God does. But Jesus is saying, I do the things that God the Father does. They share activity. And not only that, Jesus goes on to say, for whatever the Father does, the Son does likewise. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing. How many of you not only can you not do the things that God does, how many of you can see all the things that God does? No, none of us can. But Jesus had different eyes that could peer into the very depths of heaven, into the hallways of heaven, to the throne room, and see the things that God the Father was doing. He's the only one that can do that. You and I can't do that. In fact, the Bible says we can't. Deuteronomy 29, verse 29, the secret things belong to the Lord our God, but the things that are revealed belong to us us and to our children forever, that we may do all the words of this law. In other words, what... What Moses is saying there is that the things that are written down for us to understand about God, they are there so that we could obey God. But there's a whole lot of things about God that you're never going to know. And that's okay because I'd rather have a big God that I can't understand than a puny God that my little brain can imagine. But Jesus says the opposite. He says, I can see everything that God the Father is doing. I know it all very well, he says. So Jesus, the Father and the Son, share activity. They also share authority. For he goes on to say um, that he's going to have authority and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Whereas the Father raises the dead and gives them life, so also the Son gives life to whom he will. What is the greatest power in all of the universe? The greatest power in all of the universe is to create life out of nothing. And that's exactly what we see God accomplishing at the very beginning in the book of Genesis. He's creating something from nothing. Ex nihilo is what uh, the Latin is on that, meaning out of nothing. And then Jesus here is claiming to have the exact same power and authority. And he goes on to say that the the Father has granted judgment, all judgment to the Son. All the judgment. That means the right to govern over all of creation. Not only did he create it, he rules over it all. When Jesus ascended, Before Jesus ascended, he told his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been granted to me. And so he has authority. And then as a result of all of those things, verse 23, he shares also the adoration of the Father. In other words, the worship of the Father belongs to Jesus as well. Listen to what it says. So he says, the father judges no one, but has given all authority to the son that all may honor the son just as they honor the father. Whoever does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. Jesus claimed to be equal to God, the most astonishing claim that any person could ever make. And here's the result. You cannot listen to what Jesus said and be neutral. And you cannot embrace God the father without embracing God the Son. You can't worship God without worshiping Jesus. The Mormons believe that Jesus was created by God, who was also created by other gods. Mormons believe in millions of gods. And it's it's a condemning heresy that they believe in. They believe that Jesus is less than God. What, what, what verdict have they made based on what Jesus is saying in the Scripture? They've called him a liar. 
And once again, other religions will say, well, Jesus, he was, and they acknowledge Jesus, Hindus and, and Muslims and other religions. They acknowledge Jesus as a good teacher or a prophet or all of these things. But you can't acknowledge Jesus as a good teacher and read words like this and deny him at the same time. You can't call him good. Now, you can deny him and say he's a liar, but you cannot call him a good teacher. We've not been given that luxury. You just can't do it. If Jesus' words are true here in the Scripture, then Jesus is absolutely Lord of heaven and earth, and he commands your worship. And one day... You will bow before him one way or the other. Even if you say, okay, yes, he's a liar or a lunatic and you don't acknowledge him as Lord, there will be a day when you will be found out to have denied the one and only son of God. And so as we consider his claim, it's an audacious claim. It's an exclusive claim. It's something that commands a verdict. Well, now, let's think for just a moment about the rest of what Jesus says in verse 25 and following. He says, truly, truly, I say to you, that's the second time he's used, uh, third time he's used those words. An hour is coming and now is here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the son of man. Do not marvel at this for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. And those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So Jesus is saying this third truth that Jesus will bring an end to evil. He is the judge. He's the judge. And so at the end of time, we'll all stand before him. And so Jesus looks at all of those people today that are accusing him. They put him on trial and he says, basically, here's here's the way it's going to go down. Y'all can judge me today, but in the end, I'm going to judge all of you. That's what Jesus said to him. He said, I mean, you're, you're putting me on trial right now because I raised this lame man up and I gave him the ability to walk. On the Sabbath day, but I'm telling you, there's going to be a day whenever you stand before me. And I will be the judge. That's what Jesus says to these people. And the same is true for you and me. Jesus absolutely, unequivocally claimed to be God with the authority of God, with the power of God. And he commands the adoration of God. From us. So let's think about his claim. And then secondly. Let us examine the evidence. That Jesus gives. So look at verse 30. He says I can do nothing on my own. As I hear I judge. See Jesus in his. Humiliated state. Meaning his incarnation. He came. And was submissive to the will of God the father. And he says I can do nothing on my own. And what he's saying is. God the Father has commanded everything that Jesus was accomplishing during his earthly life and ministry. They were one. They are one. He says, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, Jesus is saying this, but he's not just touting his own submission to the Father. Jesus is actually pointing out to the Jewish religious leaders, their own disobedience against God, the Father. And he says, if I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. So, I mean, I can claim to be anything I want to be. And social media provides me the, the a most excellent platform to be anyone I want to be. We've been telling children they can be anything they want to be for the past 50 years or so in this country, and now we've made it possible through social media. You can be anybody you want to be. All you got to do is find the right picture to post. 
And so Jesus says, I could claim to be anybody I want to be. And if I just claim it of myself, my testimony is not true. There's no reason for you to believe me if I say this. But nevertheless, Jesus is testifying about himself. So the first, the first witness that Jesus mentions is his own testimony about himself. It's pretty clear that Jesus testified about himself that he is the son of God. I want you to, we're going to back up. I want you to see a couple of verses that we skipped. Uh, John 20, verse 30. He said, I and the Father are one. Right? He said, I and the Father are one in John 10, verse 30. And then also, John 6, verse 29. Jesus answered them, this is the work of God that you believe in the one whom he has sent. He said, God sent me. John 20 and verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So Jesus said he would give life to those who believe in him. And so Jesus' words are the first witness. If I alone bear witness about myself, though my testimony is not true. So then he goes on to say in verse 32, there is another who bears witness about me. And I know that I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John and he who was born witness to the truth. In other words, they had questioned John. They brought John forward for questioning and they asked him, who is this? He says, not that the testimony that I receive is for man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. In other words, the Jews were flocking out to hear the testimony of John. But there was one day out there by the Jordan River as John was baptizing and Jesus went walking by. John stopped everything he was doing. He silenced the crowd and he pointed his finger at Jesus and he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. John testified about himself. He said, I'm not him. I'm not the Messiah. They said, well, what are you, John? He said, I'm a voice in the wilderness crying out, prepare ye the way of the Lord. What was John's whole life about? John's whole life was to bear witness that Jesus is the Messiah and to tell people to look to him, to be a pointer, a beacon, a light, burning and shining, putting the light on Jesus. Man, I wish my life was just like that. I hope that people... Think of me that way, that my whole existence is to be a spotlight. To put the spotlight on Jesus. And and Jesus said that his testimony about me is true. So they have Jesus' own words. They have John's testimony. What about the next one? The next one is Jesus' own works. Look at verse 36. He says, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. He says, there's another testimony for the works that the father has given me to accomplish. The very works that I'm doing bear witness about me that the father has sent me. What had Jesus done? Listen, Jesus was doing amazing things that no one, absolutely no one had ever seen. He was healing people, albeit on the Sabbath. He was telling a a, a lame man who'd been lame for, for 38 years, get up and walk and take up your bed and go home. Go your way, sin no more. He was healing people. He caused the blind man to see, the the lame man to walk, the deaf man to hear. Woman with an issue of blood that dried up right then and she was totally healed and cleansed. The lepers that nobody would touch. Jesus would reach out and touch them and they would be made whole. Not only that, he was speaking words of authority that no one else had heard before. He was saying things that no one had heard. He was doing things that no one had ever heard. And and then later on, we're going to see that Jesus speaks to at a graveside and tells Lazarus to come out of the tomb. And Lazarus comes out walking bound in his uh, burial clothes and he's alive. And he's been dead long enough that he started stinking. But what's even more than that? And Jesus has already said 
greater things he's going to do so that you will marvel at things. The last sign that Jesus is going to give is that he's going to be killed on the cross for the sins of mankind, then laid in a borrowed tomb. And three days later, he's going to get up out of that tomb. He's going to walk out. You know, anybody's ever done that? They never. I mean, I don't know anybody that's ever done that. I mean, it's one thing for Jesus to tell a lame man to get up. It's another thing for Jesus to tell a dead man to come out. But for he himself to be killed, buried, dead for three days, and then come out of the tomb himself, he must be God. Listen, so you say, you, I, I'm going to deny that because I don't believe it. I just don't think it's true. Well, you've not considered the evidence. I mean, you, you're, you're not seriously weighing that evidence. Lee Strobel was the, was the historical editor of the Chicago Tribune. And Lee Strobel was an atheist. And it, he, he was agno- his wife was agnostic. She didn't know one way or the other. And Lee says that he was a terrible, drunkard, alcoholic. He was angry all the time. He was mean to his family, his, his wife, his daughter, his son. He was a horrible person he, he, by his own admission and tes- testimony. But he was a really, really good journalist. Excellent uh, investigative journalist. Rose to the ranks in the Chicago Tribune. And as he was searching and doing his research and all those things, he came home one day and his wife said, I've got something to tell you. I've decided to become a follower of Jesus Christ. And it infuriated him. So he put on hold all of the research and all the journaling and everything that he was doing. And he set out on a quest to disprove the resurrection. He decided, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take this time of my life, in about a year, a year's time, I'm just going to do nothing but investigate the resurrection and see if it was true. He did all of the research and interviewed. He went to college professors. He went to scientists, medical doctors. He, he went to all of the the ancient historians, all the ancient literature. He brought all of the evidence together. And at the end of that journey, when he had all the evidence laid out before him, this is what he said. He said, it would take more faith for me to believe that the evidence, that the resurrection didn't happen than for me to accept the evidence and say, Jesus rose from the dead. And so Lee got down on his knees with his family and he gave his heart to Christ. And you say, well, I don't believe Jesus rose from the dead. On what basis do you not believe? Maybe you don't want to believe because you don't want to accept the responsibility that comes to you from the truth that Jesus was raised from the dead. The moment that he came out of that tomb, heaven and earth proclaim that he is the son of God. That no one else has the authority to do that. Only Jesus does. So Jesus says, these works that I do, they bear witness to me. And not only is he raised from the dead, but he is coming back again. He will come back. Again, and you will see the heavens opened up and you will see the Son of Man appear. And so Jesus is on works. And then the fourth witness is the Father's testimony. Look at verse 37. And the Father who sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you've never heard. His form you've never seen. And you do not have his word abiding in you for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. Now, Jesus is saying that directly to the Jews, but the disciples are hearing and they're going, oh, yeah, we heard that. We we heard God, the father speak. This is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And they also heard the voice there on the temple mount saying, 
uh, I have glorified it, and I will glorify it once again when Jesus, when Jesus said, Father, glorify your name. And so they've heard the voice of God, but the Jews, they had deaf ears and hard hearts, and they never heard the voice of God, the Father. But listen, if you will honestly come before God and say, God, I hear everything the preacher is preaching today. I hear the testimony, the claim of Jesus. God, if this is true, reveal it to me in my heart. And if you mean that with all your heart, God the Father, through his Holy Spirit, he will reveal to you that Jesus is the only hope for your soul. Not only do we have the Father's testimony, but the last testimony, number five, is the Scripture. Now look at what it says in verse 39. You search the Scriptures because you think that in Him, in them you have eternal life. And it is they that bear witness about me, but you refuse to come to me that you may have life. Now, we think about the Old Testament Scriptures. So scholars say there's at least 30 explicit references to the Messiah in the Old Testament least 30 of them and 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 of these 30 how many of them have been fulfilled by jesus every single one except for the ones that are still future that refer to his second coming that hasn't happened yet but jesus promised to fulfill those as well and so jesus fulfills them all perfectly And, and and it's amazing how he does that but a professor at westmont college has calculated the probability of one man fulfilling just eight, listen, just eight of the major prophecies made concerning the Messiah. The estimates were worked out by 12 different classes representing some 600 university students. The students carefully weighed all the factors, discussed each prophecy at length, and examined the various circumstances which might indicate that men had conspired together to fulfill a particular prophecy. Finally, he submitted his figures for review to a committee of the American Scientific Affiliation. Upon examination, they verified that his calculations were dependable and accurate and in regard to the scientific material presented. After examining only eight different prophecies, they conservatively estimated that the chance of one man fulfilling all eight prophecies was 1 in 10 to the 17th power. I don't even know what that looks like. When you you think about that figure, it's a 1 with 17 zeros behind it. The professor gave this illustration. If you mark 1 of... Ten tickets and place all the tickets in a hat and thoroughly stir them. And then you ask a blindfolded person to reach in and draw just one. His chance of getting the right ticket is one in ten. Right, simple illustration. Suppose we take ten to the seventeenth power silver dollars and lay them on the face of the state of Texas all over the ground. They will cover the state of Texas two feet deep. Okay? Now mark one of the silver dollars and stir the whole thing up. And then send a blindfolded man out into the state of Texas and say, you can walk as far and as long as you want to, but you've got to find that one silver dollar. That's the chance of one man being able to fulfill even just eight of the explicit 30 prophecies concerning the Messiah in the Old Testament. Written written well, I can tell you, it's not going to rain today at the park. Because I've prayed about that. At least it's going to have, there's going to be a break in the rain, at least long enough for, for us to have baptism. Somebody say amen. Okay, good, you're with me. But can I predict the future? No. It may pour, it may rain cats and dogs, and we may just like take the bas- baptismal candidates out there for a second, and let them get wet, and bring them back under the pavilion. I don't know. No, we don't do that. We don't sprinkle in this church, but we don't. 
drenched. We immerse. So, so I can't predict the future. I can say with pretty, pretty good certainty based on the weather reports that it's going to be nice out there. But we're talking about hundreds of years in advance, God says who the Messiah will be. And if you look at Daniel's prophecies, by the way, the Son of Man title comes directly from Daniel. And Jesus is identifying himself as the fulfillment of the prophecies in Daniel whenever he says, because he is the Son of Man. He's saying, I am he. I'm the one that the Old Testament fulfills. If you look at the book of Daniel, in Daniel chapter 9, he fulfills down to the date, the day that the Messiah would be crucified, lifted up above the earth. On the cross. Nobody else can do that. And you look at the evidence. The evidence is clear. And so here's. After we've considered his claim. We've examined the evidence. Lastly we've got to render the verdict. What's the verdict for you? Where will you stand? As I examine the evidence myself. I have to say with absolute clarity that Jesus is the Son of God and the Messiah. The Jews that day, Jesus indicted them as they had him on trial. He said, you refuse to come to me that you may have life. He says, I do not receive glory from people, but you know that you do not have The love of God. But I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you'll receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Jesus says to them, the reason that they're not receiving him is because they want glory from each other. What what does that amount to? It, It amounts to pride in their own heart. They'd rather, they'd rather bow to other men so that they could receive accolades and honor from other people than to submit to the one and only true God. And then not only that, Jesus says, not only do you want glory from other people, do you not think that I will accuse you for the, to the Father? There is one who, do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me. But if you do not believe this, uh, believe his writing, how will you believe my words? What did, what did Moses say? Well, Moses said that there is a prophet who's coming who will be like me, and you will listen to him. That's what he told the people. So Moses himself even proclaimed the coming of the Messiah, proclaimed Jesus. But if you look at the bulk of everything that Moses taught, this is what Moses taught. He said, if you keep the law of God, you'll be blessed. He said, choose life that you may live. And so if you keep the the law, then you'll live. If you don't keep the law, you'll have a curse. And then what did all of the people do? They broke the law. Every single person, man, woman, boy, and the girl, boy and girl on this planet has broken the law of God. This is what Moses teaches us. And these self-righteous Pharisees and Sadducees believed that they were keeping the law. They were that they were good. They didn't need no Messiah. Jesus says to him, listen, if. If you believe, if you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me. Because we're saying the same thing. Moses is testifying about me, is what Jesus said. In other words, Jesus is saying the same thing. You're all sinners. And we all need salvation. And Jesus is the only one who fulfilled the law perfectly, died in the sinner's place. And then prove that he was God by raising himself from the dead. I want you to bow your heads and close your eyes. And just for a moment. I want you to just for a moment. Right there in your heart. In your pew. Consider his claim. That he is God. That he himself is God. And the Messiah. The only Savior of the world.
and that he will judge the world one day. Consider that claim. And then also, I want you to examine the evidence. His own word, the testimony of John, the works that he did that no one else could do, the things that he said that no one else ever said, the testimony of God the Father that was witnessed by the apostles, and then also the scriptures that are laid bare for us, the empty tomb. Just just examine that evidence for a moment. And what is your verdict? How has your life aligned with that? Maybe you're a Christian today. And you've said many times, I believe Jesus is Lord and Savior. I believe that. Maybe you've said it, but you haven't been living boldly for this same Lord and Savior that you proclaim. You've been spending a lot of times, wasted years, wallowing in your own sin. And Jesus is calling you out of that into a life that's dedicated to Him. And He wants you to renew your commitment to Him today. Maybe you're here for the first time and you never quite heard it put like this before and the Spirit of God is convicting you and saying, yes, this is true. You prayed that prayer with your heart saying, God, if this is true and this is real, would you let me know? And right now, in this moment, He's placing it on your heart so heavily That you can't do anything other than receive Him because of who He is. Jesus said, He who hears my word and believes Him who sent me has eternal life. It means the moment that you say, Yes, Jesus, I believe, and the verdict is rendered in your heart, you don't have to wait till you die to have eternal life. You can have it now. You can have abundant life now. Your living and breathing can change forever. And if you're ready to receive Him, I want to invite you to do so. And I want to lead you in a prayer. And this is just, a, this is just putting words to the prayer that's already in your heart. That's all it is. So you say this prayer with me. Say, Jesus, I admit to you that I am a sinner. I've done things that I know are wrong. And I've failed to do the things that I know are right. And I deserve the penalty for my sin. But Jesus, I believe that you are who you say you are. You are the Son of God. And you died on the cross for my sin even though you'd never sinned. Jesus, I believe that you were raised by the power of God on the third day. So I ask you to forgive my sin. Come into my heart. Make me a new person. I'll spend the rest of my life loving you and serving you. Thank you, Jesus, for my salvation. And it's in your holy name I pray. Amen. I want you to stand with me. This is your invitation. And if you've prayed that prayer and you meant it with all of your heart, the public profession of your faith seals the deal. It's saying, yes, I truly believe. And so it also adds you to the family of faith because we will welcome you and receive you here. We want to provide opportunities for you to grow. We want to provide an opportunity for baptism. And so don't hold that in your heart. If it's true, proclaim it. And so this is your invitation. If you're a Christian and you say, my life is not pointing to the verdict that I've made in my heart, which is that Jesus is Lord and I want to rededicate, this is your opportunity. Or if maybe you just need prayer, you can come. If you're looking for a place to serve and love the Lord Jesus and worship, And you know that God is leading you here to Myrtle Grove Baptist Church. We want to welcome you during this invitation. Whatever the case is, you spend time with the Lord now.